from Galilee. A love story by Marjorie Holmes. We're in our fourth in a series of readings from the book Two from Galilee, published by Fleming A. Travell Company. This is an edited version of the Marjorie Holmes story, which was uh, written in the early 1970s. Yesterday we learned of Mary and her suitors, the number of gentlemen in the area who were interested in Mary, but Mary was only interested in one, that was Joseph. And she boldly and brazenly went to her father and asked that Joseph be allowed to come for supper that night. Uh, her father finally, at the very end of chapter two, agreed, and what we'll hear today is her father, Joachim, uh, getting ready and asking permission of her mother to have the guest over as we listen to chapter 3 from Two from Galilee. It was Joachim who went plodding down the cobbled streets. A great irritability goaded him, together with other emotions. He found it hard to sort out. Yet this was no errand for a blind child as Hannah had made plain. You must be out of your mind to suggest such a thing, she said and he sensed her consternation that their son, sightless and halt, should come groping into the inferior house of Jacob on such a mission. Well then, Joachim had retorted, he'd go himself. Hannah's protest that this would only lend more significance to what could otherwise be passed off as merely an invitation to discuss a loom simply made firmer his determination. Just when the loom had entered the discussion he didn't recall, except that Hannah, seeing he was not to be dissuaded, had cleverly worked it in. Certainly we can't have Jacob thinking we're so hard put to find suitors for Mary that we'd go making advances to any young man, least of all his son. Joachim had refrained from the arguments that sprang to his lips. He'd long ago learned that the best way to handle this acrimonious little mate was to let her seem to have her way. Let her scold, he thought, with a kind of grudging admiration. So long as he did not stoop to contending with her, he retained his stature as a man, and his will prevailed. Joachim stomped along, his dry red beard bristling in the sun, dreading his mission, yet feeling an irascible satisfaction in it, too. He had a private sympathy for Joseph. He, too, had been forced to leave the village school at an early age to support his mother and sisters. And though Joachim had been a slow scholar, he loved learning. In a secret part of himself, he fancied he'd have made a good rabbi, and had suffered the scorn of his family by poring over the few books he owned. He particularly loved the scriptures that spoke with such certainty of the coming Messiah. He would come. He would come in all his glory, perhaps even in Joachim's lifetime. The dream made tolerable this life of toil when you were only robbed for your sweat in taxes. Finally, he arrived at Joseph's father's house. Banging on the door with the heel of his hand, he stooped and thrust his big shoulders into the shop of Jacob the carpenter. There seemed to be no one about, and he felt again that plaguing irritation. Hannah was right. He was on a fool's mission. Humor Mary if you must, but remember that Jacob's son must not be encouraged. The place smelled of sawdust and chips and curly yellow shavings. Impatiently, Joachim sifted its mealy dust through his fingers. Some people could afford to laze the afternoon away, but he had work to do. He was about to leave when he heard the commotion, the shouting and the laughter and the frenzied squawking of a hen. In a minute, the curtains that led into the adjoining cave parted and the shop became a wild flurry of feathers, children, and flying chips. In hot pursuit of them all was the object of his quest. Joseph had been laughing when he plunged in, and at the sight of Mary's father he sobered. His pleasant face flushed. Forgive me. He threw back his shoulders. His cleft chin jutted. I'm afraid we didn't hear you. As you see, we're trying to catch the hen. The bird had flown into a beam just over Joachim's head, where she was scolding them in frenzied clucks. It was given my father for mending an axle, Joseph said. Since it's my sister's birthday, mother intends to make it into stew. Joachim cringed in his own bones at the youth's embarrassment. Explanations always troubled Joachim. A birthday celebration, he said over heartily. Relief quarreled with his vexation at failing Mary now that he had come. Well, no matter, since I've only come about a loom, 
My wife would have you look at the old one to see if it's beyond repair, and, well, we had thought, uh, <coughs> he cleared his throat, perhaps you'd prefer to come late in the day and maybe be our guest for the evening meal, uh, but no matter, perhaps another time, he said hastily. The joy in Joseph's eyes was almost too much to countenance. Joachim looked up. The distraught bird above him was flapping her wings, raining dust down on his tunic. Joachim grabbed her. But if the loom needs attention, let me get to it at once, Joseph said. My family will excuse me from their celebration. Joachim handed over the fat hen. I I'm afraid we, we won't have so royal a feast that you'd be enjoying here. I wouldn't have the wife or daughters of Joachim trouble themselves over what is served to me, said Joseph. The honor of being asked to my Lord's house is more than enough for me. Well, Joachim said, until this evening then. He covered his astonishment, turned on his heels. Striding up the hill, he veered right toward the market. It was late in the day. Such few fish as there had been were gone, and there never were very many fowls. Even so, he found a fat duck which he bought and carried determinedly to the home of the rabbi where he blessed it and killed it. If the family of Jacob could eat flesh when it was not a feast day, he thought, then so could his. Joseph watched the burly, departing figure with a sense of amazement. Even the thrilling encounter with Mary this morning had not had the impact of this visit. He braced himself where he stood at the door. Joseph could not help it. He'd uttered his humble, insistent prayers almost from the day he had first become aware of Mary, the daughter of Joachim. At first they had taken the form of sheer grateful adoration. Praise be to Yahweh for fashioning her for me. Innocent, callow, straightforward, there had not been the slightest doubt. She was his, that radiant little being whose great eyes became so enchanted when he tossed her a ball to catch or sailed the little boats he'd made for her. Joseph thought of those early years. Just when the prayers had turned to desperate imploring, he didn't recall. Was it when other boys first began to notice Mary, to discuss her beauty among themselves, to vie for her hand at dancing? Even then, though he had been assaulted by a fierce, jealous sense of protest, he had been fortified by the almost serene conviction that no outer force could alter, that God had given her to him. Outwardly, he had remained composed. He had evaded the issue of marriage with ancient quips and ironic jokes about its miseries. Besides, I'm so poor, who would have me? Whistling, he'd gone on carving the spindles of the cradle he was building for a well-to-do bridegroom friend. His father asked, You're waiting for someone, isn't that it? Jacob's merry, sly little eyes shone in their darkish pouches. If Mary, daughter of Joachim, was old enough, then we'd see. You'd be anxious enough even if it meant lying with her. The image, so stirring yet so unspeakably put, filled Joseph with a blind fury. But his mother's words, however kindly, were, were even more insufferable. Well, if that's what's keeping you from marrying and bringing grandchildren into this house, my son, I fear you'd best forget it. Hannah sets great store by that girl. Joseph's eyes blazed. Am I then so poor a thing in the sight of my parents? Do you think that any other man would make Mary a better husband? No, no, now, now you know better than that, protested Timna. That's not the issue. Your mother's right, said Jacob with his usual quick resignation. We're as well born as the parents of Mary. Why, we've all come from the royal stock of David, he declared. But for some reason they think awfully well of themselves, those people. They've set their sights high. Now me, I wouldn't care to compete with either Reb Levi or Reb Saul's sons. It would only mean further humiliation for this family and for you. So come on now, stop brooding and wasting your time. Playfully he jabbed the flesh of his son. You're a strapping youth and fair in the eyes of all the maids. Yes, said his mother, and estimable in the sight of their parents as well. His father said, choose someone else. It won't be hard. Take Leah, Mary's cousin. She's been mooning over you. Just say the word and we'll ask her parents. He thought back to the days when he could bear it no longer. Blindly, scarcely knowing what he was doing, he'd flung off his leather apron and run out into the streets, thinking that maybe Abner or Cleophas might have Mary. Abner, the thought of that cold, thin-necked creature ever laying his skeletal hands on Mary, filled Joseph with such revulsion that he almost retched. And as for Cleophas, he caught up a rock and hurled it savagely over a precipice. The handsome face taunted him. 
the heavy-lidded eyes, the seductive, gaily jeering mouth. Again, Joseph heard the remark that Cleophas had made about Mary one Sabbath on the way to the synagogue. It had set Joseph at his throat. One minute, friends, the next murderous enemies. They'd rolled in the dust, dressed though they were in their best garments, battering each other. Then, after the bloody fight, Joseph paced the fields and forests, scarcely knowing where he went. But in late afternoon, thirsty and spent, he had flung himself down under a tree and slept. And when he awoke, it had been with a curious sense of release. The sun was setting, laying a banner of flaming orange across the sky. The wind was blowing. Is it never to be then? Joseph demanded of God. He searched the sky vainly at a moment for some sign, and Joseph's eyes were wet, in part for the loss of Mary, but in part for the loss of his faith. He thought with shame and bitterness of the long communion that in his desire he had conjured up. He had given himself the answers all the time. Now he saw that the true worshiper does not always expect answers. Were the days long past when God summoned Moses up onto the mountain or revealed himself through a burning bush or a ladder of stars? Should a true believer expect such evidence from Yahweh now? So be it, Joseph said. He flung himself over, brought his fist down savagely upon the hard, unyielding earth. O oh God, my God, if this be thy will, then so be it. Thy will be done. And then the peace of his first awakening came over him, and he lay quiet once again. He lay regarding his lifted hands. Scarred though they were, he knew their strength and skill. They could fashion things, good, worthy instruments for the business of living, plows and wagons and yokes and benches and tables, for he'd prove that celibacy need be no disgrace. He'd build houses and furnishings for the married. Someday he might even build the cupboards and railings in the synagogues. He'd give his life to the Lord of life. He had risen up on that day many months ago and brushed the earth and leaves from his tunic and came back to the village, curiously cleansed and freed. His parents, sensing some strange change in him, did not badger him any more. They were strangely quiet about Mary, though the news had gotten about. Her betrothal was not imminent at all. No suitor was considered up to Hannah's expectations. At least Joachim had found excuses to put the suitors off. Relieved though Joseph was, he had gone on hammering nails into boards, hammering his hopes back into subjection, for he must turn his thoughts elsewhere. But now, this day, staggered, he watched the departing form of Joachim, it was as if the thick shoulders and the faded brown tunic, the staff that almost truculently struck the stones, were bathed in a small burning cloud of glory, belying his hard-won knowledge that no more did Yahweh mingle in the affairs of men. Joseph's face was slightly dazed as he turned back to the shop. His father waddled in, rosy and puffing from his own merry chase of the hen. What ails you, son? he asked. You look as if you've just seen a vision. Perhaps I have. Joseph said. That was Mary's father. I've been asked to his house to share the evening meal with them. And so we end chapter 3 with Joseph preparing to go to Mary's house for dinner. We'll continue tomorrow with more from Two from Galilee. Galilee.